TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom, good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. The Israeli government has extended a general nationwide lockdown for an additional five days set to expire later this week at 7 a.m. on Friday. Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz warns that any future war in the Middle East wouldn't be just a military-to-military -military confrontation. U.S. National Security Advisor Jack Sullivan voices alarm over the rapid pace in which the Islamic Republic of Iran is accumulating fissile material for a nuclear weapon. The Israeli government has extended a general nationwide lockdown for an additional five days set to expire later this week at 7 a.m. on Friday. In addition to the domestic closure, the Jerusalem cabinet also approved keeping the country's borders closed, effectively extending a ban on entry to and exit from Israel, apart from existing humanitarian exceptions until February 7th at midnight. In a film statement prior to voting on the extensions, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sought to justify the cabinet's decision. <laughs> ביתר סט, על ידי שתי מוטציות, המוטציה הבריטית והמוטציה הדרום אפריקנית. שיעור התמותה היומי בבריטניה הוא פי שלושה מישראל, וכל כל אחד שהולך לעולמו זה עבודה, עבודה גדולה מאוד. מערכת הבריאות במדינות רבות על סף קריסה, וגם בישראל המערכת הבריאות שלנו נמצאת במתיחת עברים מקסימלית, ולכן סגרנו את השמיים ראשונים בעולם. אנחנו במרוץ מאוד אדוק לחסן כמה שיותר מאזרחי ישראל אל מול התפשטות המוטציות. אנחנו יכולים לעשות את החיסון הזה בזכות מיליוני החיסונים שהבאנו ואנחנו מביאים לישראל. אני מקווה שאם לא תהיינה הפתעות נוספות, אנחנו נוכל לפתוח את החינוך והכלכלה שלנו בהדרגה. It is worth mentioning that Netanyahu's repeated demands for extending the nationwide closure is faced with growing public criticism over a perceived bias in all that pertains to enforcement of the government-enacted restrictions. While the majority of Israelis are seemingly obedient, protests and mass gatherings evidently continue to be a common reoccurrence. However, in contrast to protests against the government, which are subject to heavy police enforcement, Mass gatherings by members of the ultra-Orthodox sector, the main political allies of Prime Minister B. Netanyahu, have not faced equal enforcement. This reality has played into the hands of Netanyahu's political rivals who accused the Prime Minister's crisis management of being tainted out of political considerations, allegations the Israeli leader vehemently denies. <laughs> התקהלות זו התקהלות זו התקהלות. זה לא משנה אם מדובר בחרדים או בחילונים או בערבים. לצערי יש התקהלויות בכל הצדדים, בכל הציבורים הללו. צריך להפסיק את זה מיד וצריך להפסיק לעשות מזה פוליטיקה. להתמקד בהפרות של ציבור אחד ולהתעלם מהפרות של ציבורים אחרים. כולם צריכים להפסיק. זה הזמן לאחדות. חובה לשמור על הכללים, לשמור על מרחק, למנוע התקהלויות בכל מגזר. The latest in a series of violations by the ultra-Orthodox sector included two funeral processions in Jerusalem last night, attended by tens of thousands. Instead of thwarting such a procession from taking place, in accordance with government-enacted guidelines, police commanders decided to forgo enforcement at the scene altogether. <laughs> הם עמדו בעצם בסיכום אחד, שזה היה מסלול הלוויה, ובכך מנענו את ההתערבבות שלהם, בעיי הלוויה, ביחד עם אזרחים אחרים, כדי למנוע הדבקה. שימוש בכוח במצב שהיה היום בתוך שכונה, כשהגופה נמצאת ברחוב מסוים, היה בעצם מביא לשפיכות דמים. כל שימוש באמצעים לפיזור המון היה מביא לבריחה המונית ולהתעמתות. למשטרה יש ניסיון בנושא של אירועים המוניים. ולכן לא נקטנו בשיטות האלה על מנת בעצם אה, למנוע פגיעה בחיי אדם, פגיעה בחפים מפשע, ובעצם יהיה איזושהי יצירת מצב של אלימות כל כך קשה שהייתה משפיעה בהמשך 
על uh, uh, הסדר הציבורי בירושלים והוא ייתכן בכלל בארץ uh, לצו, במצב כזה של הפרות סדר המוניות במשך תקופה ממושכת. It is interesting to know that while the ultra-Orthodox sector constitutes approximately 11% out of Israel's 9.2 million citizens, the Israeli Health Ministry acknowledged that the sector has accounted for roughly 40% of the country's newly verified coronavirus cases. And while Israel continues to struggle with tackling the spread of the corona contagion, the enemies of the Jewish state are not abandoning their malign aspirations. An attempted stabbing attack at the Gush Etzion Junction, situated in the West Bank, was reportedly averted at the early hours of yesterday morning. The IDF spokesperson's unit released a statement following an investigation into the incident. Per its statement, a Palestinian individual armed with a knife rushed toward a number of Israeli civilians at a bus station. After calling upon the assailant to stop, IDF troops responded with fire toward the assailant and neutralized the threat. No injuries were reported among the civilians or IDF troops. This was a second such incident within less than a week. Turning to the Indian capital, New Delhi, where an improvised explosive device, or IED, detonated adjacent to the Israeli embassy shortly after 5 p.m. local time on Friday. Sir, we have collected all the people who have handed over. There was an explosion. What was the explosion? After the examination of the laboratory, we will tell you about the chemical examination. Sources provided TV7 with some insight, revealing that the IED was hidden in a berth of flowers on a traffic island adjacent to the Israeli embassy. The blast damaged the windows of three closely parked vehicles, but thankfully did not cause any injuries. Furthermore, it has been revealed that the device was constructed of patin, a highly explosive material, and shards of a battery were also found pointing to the existence of a timer. Furthermore, according to domestic reports, a written note was found near the blast site, which claimed that the explosion was a down payment on a series of revenge attacks to avenge the deaths of the RGC Quds Force commander Qasem Soleimani and Iran's chief nuclear scientist Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. Nevertheless, Israeli security officials are skeptical about Iran's involvement because of the poor quality of the bomb and the small quantity of the explosives material. Furthermore, the embassy was evidently empty at the time of the attack. Nevertheless, an investigation into the attack is ongoing. Well, the investigation is uh, ongoing, still gathering all the pieces and the evidence uh, that we get uh, from the scene and pieces of information from all over. There is a full collaboration between uh, the Indian authorities and the Israeli authorities. And um, as of now, our assumption, strong assumption, it, uh, that it is a terror attack that targeted the Israeli embassy. Fortunately, as you mentioned, uh, nobody was hurt and uh, all the uh, diplomats and their families are safe. Turning back to Jerusalem, where Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz warned that any future war in the Middle East wouldn't be just a military-to-military -military confrontation. In a televised interview with Cairo-based Al Jad TV, Jerusalem's top defense official emphasized Israel has a clear objective that Iran would not attain nuclear weapon capabilities. Gantz stressed that this policy, quote, is not just an Israeli interest, it is first and foremost a global and regional interest. The IDF and Israel's defense establishment are holding on to the option of taking action against Iran's nuclear project if there is no alternative. Minister Gantz further voiced Jerusalem's frustration over the fact that any future war in our region would involve many civilians. He explained that Iran's proxies including Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas and Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip aim their missiles toward populated areas in Israel, threatening Arab and Jewish communities alike. Therefore, Israel will be forced to attack missiles that are being stored within civilian populations. It is interesting to know that the voiced remarks by the top Israeli defense official were made after a newly appointed U.S. National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, voiced the alarm over the rapid pace in which the Islamic Republic of Iran is accumulating fissile material for a nuclear weapon. From our perspective, a critical 
early priority has to be to deal with what is a escalating nuclear crisis as they move closer and closer to having enough fissile material for a weapon. And we would like to make sure that um, we reestablish some of the parameters and constraints around their program that have fallen away over the course of the past two years. Meanwhile, in Iran, the Ayatollah regime launched 10 days of consecutive ceremonies marking the 42nd anniversary of the 1979 Islamic Revolution. The ceremonies kicked off when Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei visited the mausoleum of Rahula Khomeini to pay tribute to the late founder of the Islamic Republic. Thank you for watching us. As part of TV7 Israel's prayer initiative, I would like to encourage you today to join myself and the team here in Jerusalem to lift up Myanmar in prayer for its salvation and peace, alongside prayers for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world, in addition, of course, to our ongoing prayers for the peace of Jerusalem, salvation of Israel, and for all those who are impacted by the corona contagion and its numerous ramifications worldwide. I'm Jonathan Hassan wishing you a Shavua Tovu Mevorach and we will see you again tomorrow at the same time.